yes, a single person can do it. It always goes back to, as an NFO, as a Rio and then a Wizzo, I always tried to strive to make sure that in my cockpit that one plus one was more than two. Yeah. You know, what are the opportunities? If I can't be a pilot, what can I do? Serve proudly, choose to be happy and follow your core values. You know, I got to live that every day. Hello, my name is Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello. I founded the Fighter Pilot Podcast and am your usual host. But as you audio listeners know, I'm not your only host. I am assisted over there by a couple former military aviators. One is an Air Force flight test engineer, Ken Katz, and the other is a retired naval flight officer, Matt Arney, who joins me in studio for the first time. Flounder, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be down here in the uh, studio and uh, enjoying all you got around here. Yeah, well, we've had a good time so far, and now we're going to talk about naval flight officers. But golly, yeah, I mean, uh, we've had you help out with the audio, and we've done some video that we'll talk about before, but I think this is uh, really going to be your first time coming on film with me, so glad for that. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's uh, been able to do a couple of the video things, but living up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, it's nice to get down here to San Diego okay. in the studio and join you for a couple yeah, of days. Fantastic. Okay. Well, so I thought a way to introduce you on camera for everyone would be to talk about naval flight officers. So we'll get to your background in a second, but tell us, I mean, what is a naval flight officer? Naval flight officer is the collection of people who are not the pilot in a lot of the airplanes, the officers who help with you know, co-pilot duties in some cases, but running weapon systems in the variety of airplanes we have. We have NFOs, of course, in the F-18F Super Hornet. We have them in the Growler. We have them in the P-8 Poseidon. Uh, so they go across platforms, and we'll talk a little bit about pipeline and how you get into each one. But they run those kinds of duties. They can be mission commanders, but they perform different things in the different phases of flight for the different platforms. Yeah. And there are Air Force equivalents, obviously not naval flight officers, but uh, they have them as well. I think you uh, missed the E-2 Hawkeye. Yeah, that's uh, right. And then, of course, that used to be, they're gone now, but in the F-14, which is where you started, as we'll find out, you had the Rios, and then the Prowlers, I guess they were ECMOs. They were ECMOs, that's okay, right. Okay, fantastic. Well, before we get to all that, let's start with you. Now, as our Patreon listeners know, because you joined me for a happy hour, you and I go way back, but for everyone else, give us a quick summary of where you're from and, and and what you did in your career. Yeah, so I grew up in a Navy family. My dad flew F-4s. He was a pilot, uh, flew in the Vietnam era. He was a test pilot. And so I came to be at Pax River and joined the career path in the family at that point. And then he went off to do a department head tour in Virginia Beach. So I lived there for a little bit. Uh, but then we settled around the D.C. area. And so I mainly grew up in the D.C. area. But I just always wanted to fly in the Navy. That was you know, from the influence of being a little kid around it. And then even though my dad didn't keep flying, I had plenty of family friends who did, the Navy uncles. And so I just continued to live around that influence and and loved it and always what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about your career. So I went into the Naval Academy through the Naval Academy Prep School and enjoyed my time there. Uh, and then after that, there was in that early 90s where I think we go through periods in the pipeline where there's a long wait. So I actually went out to Point Magoo and joined VX4 Vampires as a stash ensign out there. So got to really enjoy flying in different platforms and experiencing the fighter community. And so then I went off to flight school in Pensacola and was able to persevere through the training to get an F-14 spot. And went to Oceana to fly the F-14 Tomcat, went to the RAG uh, VF-101 at the time, and then into the VF-102 Diamondbacks, which is, of course, where we met. When yeah, you same were, air wing. Yep, yeah, mm -hmm. in the Sidewinders and CAG-1. Did a couple cruises there. Then, you know, we have the choice, basically, as a lot of listeners know, you can go into uh, the Top Gun route, or you can go into test and evaluation, or you can go into training either at the RAG as an instructor or down in the VTs. And that VX4 experience for me really 
I knew when I left VX4 at Point Magoo, it was like, no matter what happens in my life, I said, I have to get back here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I managed to do that. Timing was right. Good. I was able to go out there as F-14B upgrade uh, operational test director. Had a great time there, flying F-14s out of Southern California and, and, and enjoying that experience. And then continuing on, um, went to be an assistant navigator on the Enterprise. So com- got completely out of the cockpit to go do something different, and that was a, a lot of fun. Uh, and then I screened for Department Ed, went to the Jolly Rogers, joined them for a Tomcat cruise, did the transition to the Super Hornet. And then after that, I went to the War College, screened for Command of the War College. So again, had time to kill. So I went out to Abu Dhabi to work in the embassy in Abu Dhabi um, for a temporary assignment and met my wife there. And so then... Uh, brought her from the wonderful living of Dubai to Lemoore, California <laughs> for, uh, for our time there and uh, joined the Black Knights VFA 154 in the Super Hornet. After that, went to operations officer on the Abraham Lincoln, joined him on deployment, brought him into Norfolk for midlife overhaul, and then figuring out you know, kind of where things were going to go. And we realized we wanted to get overseas and still wanted to keep doing Navy as long as it continued to be fun. And so we applied for the attache program. I went to the embassy in Stockholm and did a couple years there, screened for major command in the VX. So then we went from Stockholm to China Lake. And then some issues came up. Um, I couldn't fly anymore. So that's when I got reslated up to Whidbey Island. Did three years up in Whidbey Island as a commanding officer. Really great uh, position to leave the Navy from. So we elected to retire, and and now I'm up in the Pacific Northwest. Very good. I've still never been to Whidbey Island. I don't know what's wrong with me. Wow. I need to find a way to get up there. Never, Not even a gas and go or anything. Yeah. Well, that was the only reason I'd been up there in the past was just gas and go. I hadn't been off the flight line until my wife and I went up to mm-hmm. go check it out yeah. over a long weekend, and wow. uh, it's a beautiful right. place. So you've done a lot of different stuff, and you didn't always just stay in the cockpit. You went and did navigator tour, You like you said, or assistant navigator, but still, it's on the carrier, which you'd served on, mm. so now you're seeing a different side of that operation. So was that, you think— unique as we sort of unpack NFOs today, was that sort of unique to being an NFO that you had these other opportunities or just you, Matt Arney, wanting to do different things? I'd say it's a combination. Um, For me, you know, I grew up knowing that I couldn't be a pilot because I had a lazy eye and so I had it surgically corrected, but I never got my stereo vision. So I knew that I couldn't qualify to be a pilot. So I just always wanted to be an NFO uh, once I knew that. And I wanted to fly you know, off of aircraft carriers and I wanted to fly fighters. Mm-hmm. But when it came time for that decision of, you know, I knew when I went to go be an assistant navigator, I mean, a lot of coming back into the community is networking and, you know, people pulling you back in when you're so far removed. And so when it was time for me to come come back in, it was from a point of I've been on the outside and I was really hungry to get back in, mm-hmm. and I really enjoyed the time. So it, I think it was a more personal thing for me because there are pilots who do those other other jobs as well, but anybody can do those. And so back to your question, I think it's really a combination. Yeah. NFO allows you to do it. I mean, I could jump in the cockpit pretty easily when I was in those non-flying things, but I didn't really pursue it as much because I always had in the back of my mind I've had my time. There are other people who need that time. Mm. I'd rather just enjoy doing what I'm doing right now that's, and then enjoy flying when I can fly. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, it's a mature way to look at it that maybe not everyone would, you know. Mm. I'm going to get mine and you can get what's left kind <laughs> yeah, of thing. That's right. But uh, all right. So I sometimes start episodes or interviews, I should say, with like caveats or, or almost like uh, alibis, like when we come back from the debrief, you know, mm. uh, from a flight to debrief. And I feel like we should do that here because a couple things. You almost never hear about someone who wanted to be an NFO, but, oh, settled for pilot. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I want to talk about. And the other is, and it's, I hope, good-natured, but, you know, I came from a single-seat community. I don't ever honestly remember, like, consciously being a, quote, NFO hater, Mm -hmm. because why would I want to, you know, you're a friend, why would I hate on you? But there is some natural... I don't know what to call it, right? But Yeah, of course, some ribbing, ribbing, teasing, banter. So... 
I don't know if there's even a question in that, but right, I mean, an NFO is not like you're not less of a person than me because I happen to be a pilot, mm -hmm. but you had, in your case, a vision thing that kept you from being, if I may go vertically here, a pilot. So, in a sense, you settled, mm -hmm. and a lot of people do. And I feel like that sort of maybe ekes its way into the community. Like you almost know that. We wanted to do one thing, but we ended up doing the other. And somehow, again, for a guy who comes from single seat, it's very easy if I were that kind of person to say, oh, you know, you couldn't handle it or you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're less than perfect or whatever. And so, again, I don't know if there's yeah. a question in all well, this, but. <laughs> no, I think that there's there's a dynamic in there that, yeah. you know, you run across because not everybody's jello. I mean, you and I have had great relationship through our Arabian adventures and, and other things in our career path where we keep running into each other. Yeah. But there are other people who didn't feel like there is a place for NFOs. And when you look at, for example, the Hornet, you know, the Super Hornet, the E and the F model, it is very easy for somebody to say, well, I can do it in the E. Why do I need to drag somebody else and sacrifice 800 pounds of gas or whatever it is to have somebody in the F? And we can get into... There's so many things you can do in that cockpit. So if you, for example, have somebody who is better at running the Maverick, you know, and attacking with a Maverick. Like the missile, the, the missile, 65 yeah. Yeah. And then the other person might be more experienced in the harm or Argum now, then, you know, there there is value in having that when there's so many mission sets to go through. Yes, some a single person can do it. It always goes back to as a as an NFO, as a Rio, and then a, a Wizzo, I always tried to strive to make sure that in my cockpit that one plus one was more than two. Yeah. And there were certainly NFOs who we ran across who that equation didn't work out. Mm -hmm. It becomes a challenge when you do have NFOs who are not up to par, and uh, uh, and it's a struggle, especially against the mentality of others have that yeah. why do we even have NFOs to begin with? I'm just me, but I just always thought that's just a ridiculous question because we do. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you go back to the F-4, and, and you can maybe speak to this better than I can, the F-14, when they were building those aircraft in the 50s and 60s, the technology was such that it was too much for one person. That's so right. So you needed someone to run the radar. Well, yeah. The in radar, the F-14, right? you needed somebody to run all those circuit breakers in back. So, <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so, but yeah, you compare that, you know, the F-4 with all the systems and the pilot did pilot stuff and the Rio did Rio stuff. Yeah. And then you compare that with the F-35 now where we have so much more technology that the airplane could do so much more, but it can present it in a way that, that your single-seat Wizzo in that cockpit who is just running the weapon systems can do great things in that cockpit and that cockpit can do a lot more than yeah. those older ones can do. Yeah, I had that, I think, on my outline for later. But, I mean, it, it, it's such an interesting concept because, you know, you look at the F-16, let's say, or the F-35 or the A-10, we think of those as single piloted. But now we're starting to think about single NFO'd uh, yeah. aircraft because you're more of managing all those systems, which is what you did, right, if mm -hmm. I can speak for you, in the back of the F-14 or the F-18F, and you're managing all those. But I will tell you this. So, like I said, I don't think I was ever— a Wizzo hater. I'll let others decide if I was... I never got that from you. Oh, good. Yeah. But I never was as much of a Wizzo appreciator or NFO appreciator as I was when I went to the weapon school where I served with your brother, by the way, Skip. Mm -hmm. And I flew with Skip or Ofer or Steiny or some of these guys who wore Top Gun patches because they had the metal to get through and do that. And I would do what I was used to doing, single seat, but let's say we're doing some sort of air-to-air -air tactic, and instead of pointing at the threat, now I'm pointing away. And I would look down at my display, and it's showing, instead of me having to make it show me what I need, it's already showing it because Ofer or Steiny or Skip or somebody did it. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Now I can sweeten up what I'm doing or I have better SA. Um, now, in some cases, to be fair, because they were the ones talking air traffic control, my SA was a little reduced because I'm used to doing that. So I'd approach the altitude and like, whoops, you know, <laughs> that's right. stop here because I hadn't said it out loud. Exactly. So, but the other thing is, and we've talked about this on the show, I feel like, is you're right. I flew both the E and the F. And as an E pilot, I felt like I could do everything I could do in the F. But the F has an extra mission, not just the, what the aircraft can do, but the mission of uh, 
basically FAC A, which mm-hmm. I never did. But as I understand it, although there are single seat FAC A's in the Air Force, in the Navy, it's really great to have that division of labor because of all the coordination you're doing with everybody else. So yeah, I think it's not just the aircraft, but the missions. That's right. There's a great episode on the TomCast about the FAC A uh, with PK Averna. And it was such a powerful and um, inspiring mission to be able to do because you're working closely with ground force elements. You're coordinating multiple, you know, in really advanced scenarios, multiple stacks. You're dealing with different threats. So it was a very dynamic mission. As you said, yes, there are single seat airplanes that do it, usually do in section. So you're doing that, you know, sharing the load between a couple cockpits. And so certainly with us in the two seat that we could kind of do that same thing just within the same cockpit mm-hmm. and do task shedding and to be successful in those missions. So yeah, a lot of fun. The challenge for me at that point when in my career when I started flying with Wizzos was that I just wasn't used to it. I'd spent mm-hmm. so much of my career just effectively doing what I want, but also having a wingman. But now Telling you know somebody else, hey, we're gonna turn hard suddenly, so get ready. Or you know this. Or is don't what, tell them. Yeah, They'll figure it out. This is what I'm thinking. <laughs> but anyway, all right. Yeah. So enough slobbering about uh, how important NFOs are. <laughs> you, you can see I'm equal opportunity here. Uh, talk to me about selection and training. So right, you went to the academy. I went to ROTC. Mm. I remember racking and stacking. So I, I'm guessing the selection is pretty easy. But just to set the baseline, when I went to flight school, probably about the same time, the early 90s, you go to primary in a propeller-driven plane, T-34 for me, T-6 these days. Then I went to intermediate jet because I selected jets, advanced jet, went to the boat, went to the FRS, boom, F-18 pilot. What is the, if there are any differences on selection, but what is the training like for an NFO? Yeah. Again, I can speak to how it was a few years ago. <laughs> what I experienced, we all go through API together. And so it was a six weeks of weather and engines and, you know, all that kind of theory. aerodynamics and mm-hmm. theory. Yeah. And then split off pilots and, and uh, NFOs. And so then with the NFO pipeline, I went to VT-10, which we flew T-34s. We actually started with the, the basic pilot training. So they put us in the front of the T-34 so we could do a little bit of piloting for, I think it was like 10 or 12 hours. And then we got into more of the navigation training. So we did that in the T-34. And then we went into the T-39. And so the T-39 was our platform to do jet-based uh, nav- navigation training, radar intercept training. It had a, a radar in the nose that we could do basic intercept stuff. Uh, we did low altitude navigation training over kind of Alabama, Florida, that area. Mm-hmm. And so you run through the curriculum there. And then at the end of that, we did T2s for spin and basic fighter maneuvers, those kinds of things. So it wasn't until you got your wings at the end of all that that you selected for F-14s or Prowler or S3. And and then at that point, you went off to your dedicated RAG. Mm-hmm. FRS, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so was... CQ and even CQ for pilots these days is they're talking about getting rid of it because of PLM. Uh, that was one of your episodes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. But uh, was CQ part of the training VT, if you will, the before winging? No, we didn't do it. The only okay. thing we did was we would do um, like case three training in the simulator okay. with holding and stuff, trying to manage holding. But other, otherwise, we didn't do any kind of uh, obviously, you know, land in the T2. We sit in the back seat. We were introduced to landing, you know, the AOA and line up and angle, you know, meatball providing, line up, angle of attack, yeah, you know, so back up. Providing information. That kind of okay. stuff. Okay. So, again, today, like the Marine Corps, as I understand, has or is training its last uh, NFO, interestingly. But in the modern day, essentially, we have, again, we talked about the P-8, the E-2, the EA-18, and the F-A-18F. But back then, you had also the S-3, like you just acknowledged, uh, but the A-6 as well. Was the point of the training up through getting your wings particular to a platform, or was it particular to these are the different things you might have to do in the fleet depending on what platform you go to? Mm -hmm. So navigating, communicating, crew coordination maybe is part of it as well. So, And then you get the specific when you pick a platform. That's right. Okay. It was really to prepare you for any of those platforms. So it was kind of generic across all those platforms. Interestingly, we had A6BNs as instructors, 
But A6 was not an option when I went there. That was already done. Mm -hmm. But it was really great getting that kind of training. And F-14s at the time were just, when I was at VX-4, they were doing the Bombcat um, operational test and evaluation. So that was just, mission set was just coming to the F-14. But again, because of that A6BN influence and kind of general land attack training that we got, then you could go into the F-14 and learn it Mm -hmm. there. Now, you quipped earlier about the, all the circuit breakers, which anyone who's seen Top Gun Maverick can uh, remember. Uh, was it Rooster jumps in the back? Like, That's right. You know, what is all this? Uh, I laughed out loud at that you, scene in the theater. <laughs> in the theater? Good. <laughs> what, but, like, so you get through VF-101. Now you're at VF-102. You and I are both nuggets on the George Washington cruise. What would be, like, your duties as an F-14 Rio? So, first of all, it was co-piloting. You know, it was it was just backing up the you know the aviating aspect of getting the airplane around. Although there were no actual flight controls in the back, no flight controls. But it's still funny story though. Yeah, go ahead. There's a, a good friend of mine who he came in. Uh, I don't know if you remember Palms Riles. Um, yeah. He, yeah, he was a nugget on our second cruise, mm-hmm. and uh, he told me a story when he was a midshipman that, and I think that this was something that Tomcat pilots kind of did with midshipmen is. You could go half action on the trigger in the back, and there was a little circle that would show up on the display there, the TID, and on the pilot's uh, repeat. And so they would say that you can take control of the airplane. You don't have a <laughs> throttle, but if you just go half action and you move that around, you move it forward, the trees get bigger, move it back, you know, they get smaller, all that kind of stuff. And so they would just mirror it with a stick <laughs> gently. So it wasn't until he came back into the platform, he's like, that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you realized you'd been punked? Yeah, exactly. Someone, you mentioned the Tomcast earlier. One of the guests on the F-14 Tomcast, our sister show, talked about that too. Yeah. He, he had a guest pilot from another country and did the same thing. So, <laughs> Yeah, I never had yeah. a, uh, never got a flight in the Tomcat. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah but anyway. Yeah, good fun. But yes, no controls in the back. And so it was, you had a digital display up top where in the F-14A and the B, you saw the ra- raw radar returns and pulse or pulse Doppler. And then you had a TID, the tactical information display in the center, which is where you did a lot of your mm-hmm. stuff from. And the F-14B upgrade, we had, um, I think it was called the CDNU, or, but it was a controlled unit on the left that was your keyboard for entering information into the mission computers for navigation and things like that. You had the squawk in the back. You know, you had an armament panel. So these things that you couldn't fly the F-14 without, like, turning the squawk on or if you need to do something on an armament panel or put something in a navigation system, those things just weren't in the front seat. They were all in the back seat. So you couldn't fly it without somebody in the back seat. Mm -hmm. So back to, okay, I have all those things. What am I doing with them? So I am running the navigation, as you alluded to, in the two-seat with the Super Hornet. We did the communication with air traffic control agencies, uh, some of the interflight communication, especially if, you know, I'm the strike lead and I'm in the backseat, then I'm doing interflight communication. But the pilots are doing that more tactical pilot-to-pilot communication. It's not that they couldn't get on the radios. They could, and there was good reason for them to be on the radios. We could launch weapons from the back, but that was all done up front. I mean, it makes sense that the pilot is looking out and seeing that, you know, the the weapons are clear and all that kind of stuff. So in that crew coordination aspect, uh, when we had the lantern pod, I'm running the lantern pod for targeting and then getting it all set up and the pilot's using his or her cues to get it on the proper running and then pushing the pickle button. Mm-hmm. So all those things were very well choreographed uh, through our crew coordination. Yeah, and crew coordination is something that Top Gun, I mean, I think the FRS has taught it also because there's a certain amount of, if you and I were going to go jump in one of these airplanes, we would just need to make sure we sort of know the division of labor and the complement of backing each other up. But at Top Gun, there was a whole class on that. Like, hey, we think this is the best way to do it. Pilot duties are this, Rio or WISO duties are that. And if you do it well, as you stated earlier, you can really be more effective than uh, one person by themselves. I remember uh, Chile Culpepper, I'm sure you remember him Mm -hmm. as well. So he and I were at Top Gun together. He had come from the F-14, but then got trained in the F-18. Strangely, they wouldn't let that go the other way. I remember approaching Stroker. like, hey, can I get trained in the Tomcat? Like, no, Jello. Anyway, so 
Chile had said, you know, with the right Rio, to your earlier point, you could really be, he felt, he could be more effective with someone where there is that good sync and you understand each other and you maybe even have flown together a lot versus if you're on your own, now you're doing everything by yourself. So Mm -hmm. on the other hand, if you're battling, hey, no, 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 I need you to do this or hey, pilot, you should be turning that way, not this way then I would think that could also degrade from that as well. So uh, both the the training and at Top Gun, there's really best practices of, hey, we think this is how you can be most effective in this platform. That's right. And that was really great. You know, the F-14, when I got into it, it was pretty clear delineation. And so it was really good to go into it, adopt that. You know, her squadron ran off of that same mentality. And so... I mean, rarely did you have problems in the flight because everybody kind of expected that things were going to go this certain way. The targeting is going to be done this way. We're going to be flowing this direction. So it wasn't like there were reasons to have big fights about we should be turning this way, not that way. What are you doing? Obviously, it it happens sometimes, but sometimes it's just whoever's making the decision makes it with the best information they have, and then you continue to execute the mission and you debrief it afterwards. But interestingly... When I finished at 102, some of my friends were starting to go to VFA 122 out in Lemoore as the Super Warner rag was standing up. And I chose that I wanted to still invest more time in the F-14 and realize my life goal of going back to Point Mago. But um, so I, I stayed in the Tomcat community for a few more years. But as I listened to the conversations coming out of Lemoore, a lot of it was about this crew coordination aspect. You had... A6BNs, you had F-14 Rios, you had uh, F-18 pilots, all trying to come together to figure out in a non-missionized cockpit, this was the early lot Super Hornets, how do we share responsibilities? How do we have a standard for crew coordination in these low lot F-18, F Super Hornets? And I'm so glad there were good people in there trying to bring the best of all those and come up with a way. Mm -hmm. When I joined the Super Hornet, I had the fortune of joining it in a missionized cockpit when I came into VFA 103 when we transitioned. So it was a little more clear, uh, the delineation when you're in a missionized cockpit versus basically just a repeated cockpit. Yeah, and that's what I was about to ask you. So an FA-18B, let's say, is basically just a pure trainer. It has backseat controls for an instructor to ostensibly teach the pilot in the front. An F-18D could be both, and we won't waste any time on that. But an F-18F could either have controls in the back and still be flown solo because you can just soloize it, as we used to call it, or it can be missionized. And tell me what that means. And as I understand, basically, they can put in some hand controllers that are a little more effective for Wizzos to not have to keep taking their hands off because it can also act like as a brace. But also, it's just like being like trained like a piano player, like you know every finger's doing something? Or That's right. Okay. When I first flew the Hornet, I flew an F-18B when I was at VX4, and it was. It was just stick and throttle, you know, don't touch nothing unless <laughs> unless I tell you you can touch something. But then it, I think I f- only flew one time in an F-18F that was not missionized. We went out bouncing when I was at 103, uh, when I was at the VFA 106 as we were going through as a squadron. And I got in that thing after flying a missionized cockpit for so long. It's like, I have no idea what to do here. <laughs> it was a, a lower lot airplane. That's what it was. It wasn't a stick and throttle. It was the lower lot original kind of uh, hand control, okay. which was clunky at best. Hmm. Buttons did different things, and there weren't as many as I was used to and all that kind of stuff. So back to your point about the piano player, flying in a missionized cockpit with the I always called it Haas instead of Hotas. It's hands on side sticks. Because uh, you, you don't have, have these, a throttle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Haas. Right. Yeah. Because you have these two side stick controllers and your thumbs and your fingers are just doing stuff. Mm-hmm. You had basically three displays across and one up top, and you could just move your cursor around. And, and as we also progress through the software, getting fleet feedback is important. It goes back to the mantra of never fly the A model of anything because we're just trying to get it out there and then we're going to continue developing it. And so, you know, we continue to make software improvements from the fleet inputs, which really made those side stick controller inputs just powerful. You could program stuff ahead of time in your mission uh, set so that you could swap displays if you wanted to or, you know, just do different things with those 
buttons and switches on the side stick controller. So it really it really gave a lot of power yeah. to the Wizzo back there to do the job well. And was it not just the controls, but if I remember correctly, was there also like you could do something, particularly when the APG-79 came around, you mm -hmm. could do something with the radar in the back, I could do something with the radar in the front, and it's not like we're fighting each other. Yeah. You can actually be complementing each other. That's right. Yeah. With the lower lot airplanes, you'd be fighting each other over stuff. But as it got missionized, and like you said, with AESA, uh, radar, which I flew in 154, I always progress. I had the pleasure of always progressing in platforms in my career, which was really great. I have friends of mine who had to take steps backward, and I was, <laughs> I felt bad for them. You know, the airplane was in air to air mode or was in air to ground master mode, but you could still do stuff separately between the two cockpits, which again, again gave a lot of power to that kind of platform. Sure. So, for example, in the old days, if I am, let's say, flying in my F-18C and I'm going on a strike fighter mission, so I'm, I'm trying to deal with the air-to-air -air picture, but at some point, I need to attack a target. So, at some distance from it, I need to commit myself to that and forget about everything else. And then once I'm done with that, then I can look back at air-to-air. -air. In a two-seat where I can divide that, maybe you can start working on the target while I keep a little longer mm -hmm. looking outside. And now that that range that I'm heads down in a sense is reduced. And when you say, okay, it's time to roll in or whatever, then we can shorten that distance. Is that effectively yeah, that's one benefit? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we're on the strike route and I'm going to be running the air to air picture in the back seat. And then at a certain point, I'm going to transition to focusing on the air ground picture make sure, you know, I pick out the target and all that kind of stuff. And and you're going to be flying your cues to get us on the right run-in line. But like you said, you can be task sharing between that and the air-to-air -air picture while I'm heads down. And then we can transition, okay? You've got everything you need to pickle the weapon. I'm still going to be backing you up on that. But at the same time, I start looking at what's that off-target picture going to be looking like. So we can be ready to go as we come off target. Mm -hmm. So I want to step back to a couple topics we've already talked about. Um, so you were the skipper of VF-103. VFA-154. 154, that's right. Yeah. You were, were 103 you, department head. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. So you said an F-14 cannot, should not probably, but cannot be flown without someone in the back because there are certain things you have to control. Even if, just administrative flight, you know. Right, You got to turn right. the squawk on and stuff like that. right. But an F-18, like at the FRS, it's not uncommon for a two-seat to go out when there's not somebody in the back. And again, they'll just soloize it. And a lot of two And a little part of me dies every time that well, happens. Well, and that's my question. <laughs> so a lot of two-seat squadrons like 154, if I may speak for them, or 41 or whoever, like would not fly without someone in the back. And I, I never quite understood if it was sort of an NFO protection program, excuse me for asking, yeah, sure. or if it was like, no, this is a two-seat squadron. We, we, you know, we have a two-seat aircraft and that's just the standard is we're just going to always fly it with someone in the back. And the only reason I ask is I remember there were times where like, well, but if we flew it empty backseat over there, we could solve this problem we have with picking somebody up with a broken jet or whatever. And it, it almost seemed like, no, we can't be done. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, again, if there's a question in there or not. But Well, there were different squadron cultures as uh, w with that. And so certainly, to your point about a parts run or something like that, yeah, I mean, as I was a commanding officer, I would love to have a Wizzo in the cockpit all the time because basically the flight time's there. Don't com complain to me if you're not getting flight time, mm -hmm. if you're not taking those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if there was some reason, like if we needed to shuttle a pilot to go get, you know, whatever the situation is, those one-offs, absolutely. If okay. it makes sense to get the mission done, then absolutely. But as a norm, I wanted to make sure that every time an airplane took off, there were two people in it. First of all, I mean, it's just like we're a two-seat squadron. So we're going to fly two-seat. We can always practice crew coordination, navigation. And I got so much, you know, those like cross country flights, you know, they're oh, they're boondoggle to wherever. You know, you don't have to be intensely training the whole time, but that's where you really get into systems and other things. That so there was a lot of value in just making sure people had access to that. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I wanted to circle back to was crew coordination and an F fourteen because there were certain things that could only be done in the front or in the back. There was, I would assume, uh, some degree of. This is how we think we're going to do it because 
this person has to do certain things, this person has to do certain things. In an F-18F, although the controls might be different, effectively, correct me if I'm wrong, with the exception of, I think, shooting or dropping bombs, pretty much anything can be done in any seat. So did that drive, you talked about a bunch of smart people showing up at VFA 122 to figure this out, but whereas before it's like, well, we don't have a choice. This is what we have to do, and then let's just optimize that. Now I feel like you really could say, hey, the back seat could do everything and the front seat could just drive the bus, or front seat could do everything and the back seat could just be there to assist if necessary. So I feel like maybe it opened the aperture for what crew coordination would look like. Was that the case? I think so. I think that you're absolutely right. You could say the uh, pilot in an F-18 is going to be a chauffeur and the wizard is going to take care of everything. And it just doesn't make sense because you're not maximizing the value of the person up front. And if you go the other way, you're not maximizing the value of the person in back. So I think having the tension, at least my perspective from the outside of that conversation, it was there was a lot of tension. There was a lot of agendas coming from the different platforms. Damn it. We did it this way. This is the way we need to do it. It's not like they came out of some conference with the solution. It continued to be iterated upon mm -hmm. as we continue to develop the capability of the platform itself through software. So it was a really necessary process. It's, it kind of speaks to the value of tension and conflict, you yeah. know, good conflict yeah. to come up with the right solution. Well, healthy conflict, right? Yeah. Because you want to have those discussions because the person who's saying this is how we used to do it might be forgetting that that's how you had to do it mm -hmm. because the squawk was only in the back seat. That's so right. So you had to do certain things a certain way. And now it's like, hey, wipe the slate clean. Yeah, that's parochial, but now it's a different animal. So let's figure out how to best do it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, interesting stuff. All right. So you know about this, but uh, for everyone else, uh, we have a Patreon page and people there know you're coming and you've even asked them to provide you questions for some of the interviews you've conducted. So I told them you and I were going to sit down and talk about NFOs. Some of them are going to ask about other stuff too, but we'll start with the first one. Nick Brown, what is the difference between a RIO and a WIZO beside the acronym? <laughs> so RIO, Radar Intercept Officer, comes from, as far as I know, from the F4 uh, to F14 days. And remember that platform, you know, we could launch Phoenix missiles out to 100 miles against the big Russian, the Soviet bomber attack. And six Phoenix missiles at long distance. So it was a lot of running radar intercepts and there was no air to ground mission. So it kind of made sense as a name. It's something that we took great pride on, even though we took on the Bombcat mission, we were still Rios. And so again, there was a little bit of, okay, F-18Fs are replacing F-14s, so we should be Rios. Okay, I got it. Marine Corps had already taken the weapon systems officer uh, nomenclature. And the Air Force also used that in the F-15E Strike Eagle. And so it makes sense because we're running multiple weapon systems. Mm -hmm. So the name's different. The background is a little different. But the role is really the same. Yeah. You know, back up the aviation, uh, the aviating, the navigating, and the communicating and run the weapon systems. Yeah. It's just like you wouldn't necessarily bring over the BN, bombardier navigator term, from the A-6 because that's not all you're doing. And at the time, those aircraft were designed, like you said, we need someone to run the radar. Mm -hmm. So that's how that name probably came around on the F-4, let's say. Yeah. Or, hey, we need someone to work the navigation and get the bombing ready. So the pilot just flies, as I understand from the books, you know, fly the line, push the button, and the bomb comes off. Mm -hmm. So you've got a BN. So yeah, yeah. it makes sense. So a, a, a WISO, I feel like, is sort of a, almost a catch-all term. And I think it speaks to what you're doing. And then you have the ECMO to EWO. So electronic countermeasure officer in the Prowler. And remember, that was a, a pilot with three ECMOs. And so then we take that community into the Growler, where you have a pilot and an EWO. You know, I flew the Growler a couple times when I was at Whidbey and uh, didn't get a syllabus on how to execute it, but looked at some of the stuff and had a pilot walk me through it as we we're in the ranges. But my understanding, if you want to kind of boil it down, is that when we move from the Prowler to the Growler, you take the pilot and the front seat ECMO, combine those into the pilot mission, and then the two ECMOs in back, you're kind of combining that into the EWO, the electronic warfare officer. Mm -hmm. And so in that platform, again, you know, with the growler, you can do a lot of stuff from both cockpits. And so the pilot's taking on a little more of that responsibility Whereas, truly, they were just driving the station wagon back in the Prowler <laughs> in, days. In the Prowler, yeah. Well, but also, that was the technology we had, right? Mm -hmm. So when the Prowler was designed, we need a bunch of people to work all these different systems. And now that can be 
amalgamated, I don't know if that's the right word, into displays that one in the front, one in the back, we can make sense out of what's going on, make decisions based on the Top Gun equivalent. Havoc would come up with their best crew coordination, I presume, mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is what the front seat should be doing, this is what the back seat should be doing, and now we can uh, be effective. So yeah. yeah. You know, you think about the Prowler pilots, you know, when they designed that airplane, I, I don't know, I haven't talked to them, but just landing that thing aboard the carrier. It's like, you need to focus your whole mission on thinking about how you're going to bring this thing back. Yeah. You know, navigate around, do yeah, what yeah. you do, your little bow ties and stuff like that. But, you know, a lot of your brain power is like, oh my God, I got to bring this thing back. At the back. end of this whole mission. Yeah. Never mind the mission. At the end, I have to land on the carrier. But now Growlers yeah. with PLM, it kind of goes back to the value of PLM. It's still complex, but we're making it easier. And you can devote some of your brain power to actually mm. being a tactician in that cockpit. Yeah. Well, speaking of Flying in the back of the growler, uh, Jim Gundog says, thanks for all you do for us. How did you like your time in Oak Harbor and Woodby? I love the area. Yeah. <laughs> I, you said earlier you haven't been there yet. It, it really is an amazing area. It's a, you know, Woodby Island is a, it's like the fourth biggest island in the U.S. It's, oh. uh, it's very long and it has a lot of wonderful aspects to it. It's up there outside of Seattle in the, in the Puget Sound. So, I mean, bald eagles and... Peregrine Falcons and life was good. What we really enjoyed about it coming in as the commanding officer there was just the community engagement. Mm -hmm. My wife and I and my kids just love getting out in the community and representing the Navy. And And there's a lot of rhetoric and uh, discourse that comes out of the community, just as there is around any airport, air station, whatever. But um, a lot of great supporters there in the community and, and really enjoyed working with the different organizations the county commissioners, all the people who support and want to try to work together with the base to be successful. It's like being a mayor, I understand, when you're a base CO, you're yeah, sort of yeah. dealing with a lot of different things. It is interesting because it is like being a mayor plus because, you know, mayors don't usually run the airport or they mm. don't usually run the grocery stores and all that kind of stuff. So you have all those mm. elements to it. So yeah. it's, but the community out there is great and we love the Pacific Northwest living. Thus, we decided to settle there. There you go. Yeah. All right. You might've answered Jevons already. What was your experience of the differences in tactical crew coordination between F-14s, early Super Hornets with mirrored fore and aft cockpits and later Super Hornets with missionized cockpits? I think we pretty much covered that one. Yeah. I think, you know, Jevon, I always appreciate our discourse on, uh, you know, episodes and stuff, but We've talked a lot about that. So then let me let me insert one. Uh, you talked about how flying with good crew members can really make yourselves both more effective. What do you do, though, and I'm sure you've had this experience, when you're flying with a pilot who maybe is just either a little weaker or just not getting it? Like, what are some techniques? And I'm guessing it's maybe even similar to as you led squadrons and departments and a base. Like, right, leadership is about dealing with people and mm. solving little problems as you go. But what was it like for an NFO if you had a pilot who hopefully didn't get to the point where it was frightening you, but maybe just not as effective? What were some like techniques that, that was kind of common maybe for you or at least the NFO community maybe? Yeah. You know, going into it, how the particular pilot's doing. And certainly as you get more senior, you're going to be flying with more junior pilots who have gotten all the training. You know, as we continue to progress to the syllabus, maybe they're taking a little bit longer to get things. And so, so you know where your attention is going to be focused for the flight. I'm going to obviously do what I need to do tactically, but I'm going to be more of a co-pilot today or in this particular phase of flight. I remember uh, one time we were on our Kennedy cruise, our second cruise, and it was a dark and stormy night, <laughs> of course. That's how they all start. That's right. Yeah. ACLS was down, the automatic carrying landing system. ILS was down, the instrument landing system. And I was flying with the Nugget pilot. And, yeah, we'd done ASR approaches in simulators. But, I mean, in real life, out there where you can't see anything. And there was a, a lot of co-piloting. And the first approach did not end up well as we went up the starboard side of the ship when we broke out and Yikes. had the tower in front of us. And so we, you know, took a quick right turn to get around the ship. But... You know, going back up, settling down. Okay, what are we going to do differently this time? As well as I'm sure paddles came up and had a talk as well. But that reassuring voice of, hey, it's all good. That's the kind of stuff that you do. And and even I remember flying with an experienced pilot and we had a hydraulic failure in the middle of the night. And, you know, just 
being that calming, reassuring, I knew that, you know, Guido was going to be fine, but I'm there to make life easier, not make life harder. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, oh my God, yeah, we're all yeah, going to die. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So my very first non-CQ at C period, I wonder if you were there. It was April of workups for like uh, our George Washington deployment. I had a night in the barrel. Yeah. So three bolters, trip to the S3 tanker, two wave offs, because mm. by God, I wasn't going to bolter again subconsciously, mm. and ended up, thankfully, back at Cecil, where I was based. So I slept in my own bed. <laughs> uh, I came out the next day, just kind of wondering out loud, like, you know, if, if I'd had someone else with me, I wonder if it had gone that way. But if it still did, like, I wonder how I would felt about, like, I already felt bad, like my ego was shattered, you know, mm. but like how bad I would have felt for that person to say, man, sorry to put you through all that. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's a question there or not, but it was, it was a lonely night. I will say that. Yeah. Well, at least you have somebody there to commiserate with, but I did an interview with Nasty Manazer and he talks about as a nugget, you know, he had a night in a barrel, but with no opportunity to go anywhere, oh. you know, blue water and finally gets it aboard and you know it's it's that who knows if the rio in this case makes a difference or yeah. not but at least i always wanted to walk away from the flight feeling like i made things better no matter what the outcome was yeah all right let's get back to it david fine what did you find most satisfying about your role as commanding officer of nas would be see we keep coming back to would be mm -hmm. uh, and how did that compare to the things you enjoyed about flying yeah david also i've, I've gotten to know pretty well so i appreciate the question um, I already talked about the community part, and that was probably half the job was, you know, outward. And I alluded to it internally. You know, I had fire and emergency services. I had security forces. I had the whole fleet and family readiness and mental health, Navy exchange. I had the operations of the base, the public works, all those kinds of things. And so I enjoyed that, like, every 30 minutes was different. You know, I'd focus on the thing that at the time, mm -hmm. but— I'd go from that to something else. And you have to get up to speed quickly. What's the situation? Why are we talking? How can I help you to get your your things done? What resources do you need? Or, you know, what hurdles do I need to take out? And so I enjoyed that aspect. And then, of course, because of that, that also got me around the base a lot and uh, visiting with different people, visiting with tenants, you know, the uh, P8 squadrons or the growler squadrons or all the other tenants that are on the base. So I, I really love just the diversity of the job. It really keeps every day fresh. You never know what's going to happen mm -hmm. despite what your schedule has. And, you know, my office was uh, right on the flight line, and I had a great view over the runway with Mount Baker in the background. On a beautiful day, you could see Mount Baker. And you'd see those airplanes taxiing by with those, hopefully, JOs in them. And I look out there, I think, you guys have no idea what it takes for you to go take that airplane <laughs> and go flying every day. And you shouldn't have any idea. That's right. Just you need to focus it. on what you're doing. Yeah, get good at it. Yeah. And so I had a SAR Helos cadet. Mm -hmm. I'd go flying with them every now and then out in the mountains and watch them do their amazing work uh, doing rescue, being able to rescue a, a growler crew wherever at any time in that area, which is very challenging. And so they'd go out and do community rescues for mm -hmm. people who got themselves in extremis, and they, they do a bunch of those every year. And so it was just really, I think, to answer David's question, it was the variety, it was the pride, the beauty of the environment we operated in. Yeah. So, you know, when I was a the commanding officer, 154, I came up with this mantra of serve proudly, choose to be happy, and follow your core values. And so, you know, I got to live that every day. And yeah. I got to interact with sailors and, and civilians doing their jobs, trying to help them understand what their role was and that their role was important. And then they can also serve proudly, choose to be happy and follow their core values. So it was, a, it was a great pleasure. Yeah. Well, and to David's question, all those tenets could still also apply to flying. I mean, there is variety in the missions that we mm -hmm. do, especially in the F-18. Uh, it is beautiful at certain times, uh, unless you're about to land on the carrier, then the sunset, <laughs> you're <laughs> lamenting a little bit. No, stay up. <laughs> That's right. Um, but no, it's good. All right. Yeah. So uh, Joe Kunzler. I know he's a friend of yours. He yep. uh, really wants me to ask about OLF Coopville, but I told him this discussion's about NFO, so he'll settle for a Super Hornet combat story. But let me ask you this. Did you put any green ink in the logbook? Uh, you and I sort of did on Operation Southern Watch. Yep. It was mostly patrolling, but uh, yeah. do you have any Super Hornet combat stories? 
Yeah, yeah, certainly it did. Um, you know, when you're around long enough uh, in the last few decades, you'll you'll get there. And so I ended up with, I think it's about 80 or so combat missions total. First one was Basra, you know, in the Tomcat. But when I went to 103, we joined, like I said, on deployment on uh, Kennedy, back to Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And we were there for a Fallujah campaign in the Tomcat. And then we came home, turned the jets in, and, and we went back out. Uh, a year or so later, and that was my first exposure to uh, Afghanistan, which I visited there in 103 and then in 154 and some in Iraq. So um, combat story. So the interesting one, back to the Maverick, we had a particular um, mission that we were working to do to try to do some kind of counter-terrorist activity in what, theater. Is this 03 time frame? This, when is this? this was actually in... 2011, 11, okay. when I was on the Black Knights. All right. We were flying mixed section with our uh, Marine squadron. And, you know, they were carrying laser JDAM at the time. We weren't approved to carry la laser JDAM yet. But we were carrying GB-12s and, and LMAV. And we'd been doing LMAV training for this particular mission set. And so it was one of those where we never knew when we were going to have to do it. But uh, I was flying with... My pilot, my TACOR pilot, uh, Chris Keen, BJ, who just finished up Command at 213. We were FAC A's. And a lot of the time it was very docile. You know, you're, you're waiting, you're giving information uh, as an airborne ISR asset. But then once the call came in, it was like, you imagine the scene in Ghostbusters when they go in the room and they're all <laughs> shooting. And, you know, it's like, whoa, 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 nice shooting text. But I, I think we slicked off both jets, you know, just uh, releasing, you know, section LMAV delivery and rolling in to GBU-12 deliveries. And we lased for the laser JDAM delivery and all within a span. I mean, it seemed like it took like five minutes, but I think it was like, you know, two or yeah. three minutes of action. So very intense. Yeah. But really gratifying to support that ground force element when they needed it. So I want to try to circle back to them again, what we talked about before, as far as like coup coordination and the benefit of two in the cockpit. When something like that happened on that night, particularly, let's just use that night. Is it, and I hope the answer is going to be the second part of it, but is it, all right, well, now we're doing it for real. So let's just do whatever it takes. And, mm. you know, I'm going to say this or do that. And it's not what I trained to do. Or do you fall back on this is what we've been trained to do. Let's do it the way we did. And, oh, by golly, it works. Yeah, it's the definitely the latter. Okay. You know, all that training, you really are um, into that unconscious competence phase of training, going from an unconscious incompetence all the way up through developing competence mm -hmm. until you're, uh, and it goes back to, I just recorded with Nasty Manazari, he's a great reference to Top Gun Maverick and the whole, you know, you don't think, you do. <laughs> and it's not that you're not thinking up there, but you've trained for it. You're just so proficient. You're proficient yeah. and you're making it happen. And so that's really the gratification that comes from that. And, um, and so, yeah, we executed not only inside the cockpit, but with a Hornet wingman, mm -hmm how we were supposed to work together and how we trained. And so it all came off as it should. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So we already talked a little bit about your particular career, and you went on to be very successful. You had command of a squadron. You had command of a base. You went off and did some attache stuff. Getting back to NFOs, and not versus pilots, but let's call it compared to pilots. Are the career opportunities similar? I mean, can you go on to be an aircraft carrier CO or an air wing commander? Uh, you didn't do that, but some people might go those directions. Or even admiral, I mean, all the way up to maybe the chief of naval operations. I mean, mm -hmm. is there a upper ceiling, if you will, to being an NFO? No, there's not. You know, right now on the Eisenhower Strike Group, Stem Migas is the Carrier Strike Group commander. And he and I, we were in flight school together. We were in the ride together. We were in 102 together. And then, of course, we kept, you know, going back and forth throughout our career in department head and command and stuff and always stayed good friends. And, you know, he's a one-star now. He's had an air wing. He then was selected for Admiral. And he did an admiral position, and now he's a strike group commander out there doing amazing work with CAG, Starvin Marvin, who was one of her JOs when I was a department in 103. So, so yes, you have all the same opportunities. You can be an attache. You can be an ANAV. And when I say you, I mean a pilot or an NFO. Mm -hmm. And I think that later on, 
you know, pilots, a lot of pilots are just like, I just want to stay in the cockpit. And I get that. But at some point that ends. And yeah. so there's other things that you can do. And, uh, but yeah, you can, you can do all those same things. Yeah. Well, we can wrap up, but since you help with the show, I thought we could spend a couple minutes talking about podcasting, uh, particularly since we're going to have you debut your first video, uh, I think probably next episode if we get it right. But I'm reminded of, it's been, I guess, maybe a year now, I was sort of looking out for people to help. And I think at one point when I approached you about it, you said, why me? And I said, well, because you answered the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we go way back. Uh, we were on the ground in Egypt together and the Netherlands and a few other places deployed and we've always crossed paths. But I guess I would just ask you, I mean, Right, people sit and watch or listen to me. But what have you found uh, is interesting about podcasting, or, or maybe some of the challenges too? So mm. some of the strengths and weaknesses, or pluses and minuses, however you want to put it. But what what have you found in in coming alongside me and uh, and doing this? Yeah. So yeah, at that time I just was retiring out of the job. It would be Alan. We're getting settled, and I was trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. And I knew that I didn't want to just go into the defense industry. Great people in there trying to pr provide all the great things our warfighters need. I was just looking for something different. Mm -hmm. And as I was trying to navigate what that career was going to look like, that conversation came up and, you know, I, I hadn't thought about going into podcasting. <laughs> but you already had a great product that you developed. And so it was very easy for me to come in and help out. And with a little trepidation, because we all have imposter syndrome at, uh, as we do things, you know, I just kind of jumped in. And you're a great support for tips and, and stuff to get me through the fam ride and <laughs> send me on my way. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, especially because I didn't initially want to focus my career about being in defense. It's really allowed me to stay connected to naval aviation, yeah. which I love, yeah. and military aviation. And so... So it's been a great joy in that respect. And then really just being able to have these kinds of conversations is is a lot of fun. And so that's what I've certainly enjoyed out of it. The challenge is, you know, scheduling, making sure that we have what we think are interesting people, certainly interesting to us, hopefully interesting to the listeners. Uh, certainly, uh, we want to make sure that we provide good content, but it's a challenge. It's enjoyable because yeah. it allows you to network and talk with people and figure out who you know, wants to come on and, and talk about their story. So it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's easy, I think, to find guests that maybe have something they want to promote, whether mm -hmm. it's a book or a service or something. And I remember at the time, I think you were, as because you were the CEO, you were doing some speaking engagements, maybe Rotary, I'm not sure. But I think part of the reason I approached you was I thought, well, here's a guy maybe that wants to, you know, quote, build your personal brand because you put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And so people get to know you so they feel like they, you know, they have a inside. So when they want to invite you to come speak or whatever, you know, they get to know you better. But yeah. for, for me, I tell you, when I started doing it, all of a sudden, you know, you flip through the channels, you see Larry King and you don't think anything of it. Now when I see him, I'm like, wow, <laughs> <'Cause> it's, <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not easy. And I've gotten good feedback along the way. And so it's reassuring that I think I'm putting out a product that people enjoy. Yeah. But it's just, it's a great adventure through yeah. these conversations. Good. So. Good. When you think back, and I can only rattle off a couple, but let's see, you talked to OJ about PLM. You talked to, uh, was it Chunky about uh, space flight? Uh, you had someone, Pink, for NJAD. We never could decide. Yeah, Pink was Future of Air Warfare. That yeah. was my first one. Oh, okay. Because I really wanted to come in and, you know, you do a lot of great historical stuff. I wanted to try to think more about what the future of air warfare looks like. Okay. And it's great. And I continue to try to do that, but it's hard to find informed people yeah. who want to come on and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So space flight's been really fun because yeah. we have military aviators who are in space. Um, and then I decided to go deep into some history with the Hobo to Hero, which is just uh, oh yeah, great pleasure to sit down with Art Palmer and yeah. and talk with them and hear his stories. That's so. right. Forgot about that one too. Uh, yeah. Is there a favorite? I mean, Yank Cummings. We got Nasty Manazer coming up. I can't say there is a favorite. Of course. It's like asking your different. favorite kid. Exactly. Favorite kid or, you know, what's your favorite tour? It couldn't be the ANAV tour. I'm like, ah, it's up there with every ways. other one of them. Yeah. They're all yeah. fun. Yeah. No, that's good. And it's a little bit of a discovery, right? Because you think you maybe know what the 
interview is going to go like, but then all of a sudden maybe there's a, some variable or they mm-hmm. go somewhere you didn't expect. I've had some where you ask one question and they talk for 20 or 30 minutes. So like, oh, okay, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta be careful with my questions. But yeah, I like I said, I have a newfound respect for people who do this. I guess I do it for a living, sort mm-hmm. of, but uh, for those who do it well, particularly on the national scene. But uh, you've already talked a little bit about space flight. What's, what's coming up? And space is one of them. Well, that's right. So we've got a really great interview with Reed Wiseman, Tonto, coming up. So Tomcat Aviator, he's the mission commander for the Artemis II mission. And so we were able to go down to Houston to the Johnson Space Center right there in one of the simulators and do a video recording of an hour conversation with him, talking Tomcat stuff, talking <laughs> FAC A, talking uh, NASA and Artemis. And so it was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I hope that viewers and listeners get half as much joy out of the conversation as I got sitting there with them. Yeah. Well, like we talked about last night over a refreshment, we here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast sort of deliberately don't just go for the most salacious and shortest and sensational topics. We we try to be, I guess, maybe like 60 minutes, you know, let's go deep. And if we don't grow as fast as we could otherwise, well, so be it. I think we're both proud of the product we're putting out. So That's yeah, right. looking forward to that. I know you've got some other guests lined up. And so I'm glad to welcome you to the video side of things as well, because Mm-hmm. The more you're doing, the less I have to do, but uh, yeah. no, but it, it, yeah. uh, it does help, and I hope you continue to enjoy it. So that's great. Um, let's finish, I guess, where we started is as far as naval flight officers in general go, I think we talked a little bit about the future, maybe somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but you know, a, a, an F-35 pilot has almost become more of a single-seat F-35 whiz, although I don't think the Navy's ever going to go to that or any of the that's others. Right. But but that's essentially what you're doing is you're assimilating all that information, making those decisions. I think we talked about the training, the career path. What yeah. did I not <clears throat> ask you about naval flight officers that maybe uh, watching or listening audience needs to know? Yeah, I mean, as we look at the future, and you know, I always think about some of the segment of listeners who are younger and maybe aspiring. And, mm. you know, what are the opportunities? If I can't be a pilot, what can I do? if I want to be close to military aviation. Well, first of all, you still have NFOs in P-8 Poseidons, which are relatively new. They're going to be around for a long time Mm -hmm. with an amazing mission of maritime uh, dominance, and that's going to continue to evolve over time, So, and a very comfortable ride, having been in one. Then you've got your growlers, which are also very essential to our mission set, and they're going to be around and and funded well, and they're going to continue to have advancements as we get into the next-gen jammer uh, when it comes out and all these kinds of things that that platform does. So there's great opportunities there. And, oh, by the way, you get to live in a really wonderful place. I mean, you If know, we haven't made that clear yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and it's also interesting because, you know, it's, it's not like Whidbey Island is a mecca for electronic warfare, but it's just kind of where it started off organically. And so therefore, we've built up an infrastructure around it. So sure. the growlers will always be there. We need to go to Fallon or Nellis to have very complex training for the growler community, but the growlers will will be there. So anyway, you've got that and you've got the E2 Hawkeye, which E2D is an amazing platform. A lot of really great uh, opportunities for NFOs in that platform. 30, 40 years down the road, I don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, Nobody does. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the NFOs will, you know, if you are if you were going to be an NFO, you'll be flying on manned stuff at that point. Who knows? Okay. But at least for the next few decades, there's a lot of really great opportunity to be a warfighter in uh, airplanes as an NFO. Cool. Excellent. Well, apart from hopefully continuing to help me with the Fighter Pilot Podcast, thank you. What's the future for you? I've got my own uh, consulting uh, com- company. Can you call it a company when you're one person? If you've got a website, you can tell us and people can go That's decide right. for themselves. But it's uh, CAS Enterprise Management. And a couple of years ago, I came up with this. And uh, CAS, of course, close air support. So, you know, it's always near and dear to my heart. But it's complex, ambiguous, and strategic. Hmm. When you're running businesses... Every problem you run into that's worth getting an outside opinion is going to have those three attributes to it. So I really enjoy coming in and helping out with people trying to solve complex, ambiguous, and strategic problems for companies, regardless of industry. I spent the last couple of years in the technology industry doing commercialization of, of technology products, and that's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of, a lot of great learning. 
And as I continue to kind of move forward in my career, we'll see what kind of opportunities I can create. But I want to continue doing podcasting. Another thing that is very near and dear to my heart, my, my boys are 10 and 12, and we're deeply embedded in youth sports. Youth lacrosse just started off with the Everett Seawolves, so we got our first games coming up this weekend. And so I'm a director of the boys youth program helping out with that. And then the vice president of the youth football and cheer program right. that we do in the fall. So we're already planning registration opens up for that in March. So it's really a great pleasure to be able to provide that kind of time because community is important. Opportunities for kids are important. And then scouts, you know, we're a big scouting family, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. So we're Scouts Fantastic. BSA now. So That's all right. those things are keeping me plenty busy. Okay. Very good. All right, final question. I'm not even sure I know this one, but I have a hunch. Mm. Matt Arney, call sign Flounder. I wonder if we were maybe our generation just at the tail end of Animal House. Yeah. Because sometimes you get movies that uh, Farva, there's a lot of Farvas. There's a lot That's of right. Blue there are. and yeah. everybody, but Frank, uh, Frank the Tank. But uh, was that it or was it something else? It was pretty much that. It, okay. It, funny, when I was in flight school, um, we... Pensacola, we lived on the beach, had to live on the beach sure. there on Perdido Live Key. Live up all you can. That's right. And we had a volleyball net, and my roommate, Eric Bach, and I played, we played two-man volleyball. We called him Tuna because he always ended up in the net, and me, Flounder, because I always ended up in the sand. But uh, <laughs> but later on, you know, I went through, when I was at BX4, it was hazmat, and, you know, you would go through different things. Yeah. But it wasn't until I came to 102, because my brother had left in May of 96, and then I got there in September of 96. And so it was, boom, call signs, flounder, hero legacy. We had to take you from the animal house. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and so then for my change of command party in Lemoore, we did an animal house theme toga party in the Oak Club. Had a lot of fun with it and had animal house, the movie playing. So good stuff. Yeah, great fun. Cool. Flounder, thank you for explaining NFOs. And I don't know if right now my pilot buddies are all throwing stuff at like, oh, come on, <laughs> man, you're giving them too much credit but yeah uh, well now, my nfo buddies are might be throwing some stones at me too about things but that's all right can't please everyone that's right yeah but uh no i'm really thrilled to have you alongside uh, on this podcasting journey and if everything works out the way we hope the next video episode will feature you and tonto so uh, in fact we need to record a little bit to uh, go with that so that's right we should probably knock off and get to it sounds good awesome well thanks for joining me thank you jello i appreciate all the opportunity you've given me and it's great to be here in person with you Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I still do every single time. Now, in case we had some jargon that you didn't understand, head on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary that explains commonly used military aviation terms. And while you're there, check out the merchandise and books that we have for sale, as well as the blog that we call Musings. So thanks for joining us this week here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long.